Hello again class, welcome to chapter 6. In this chapter we're going to be talking about skeletal tissue. As always, here are your learning outcomes. We're going to be covering each line of information throughout this presentation. And one more page of learning outcomes. All right, so we're going to start with the overview of bones, learn different ways of classifying them, and then we will dive into more detail. Obviously, the title of the chapter is skeletal tissue, so the majority of our topic today is going to be on bones. We'll also spend some review time talking about cartilage towards the end. And ligaments, we're going to talk more about in the joints chapter. Ligaments, once again, are connective tissue that connects bones to other bones. Now, the primary function of skeletal system, just like we did in the skin, right? The skin has many, many different functions, but the main job, the overall arching theme was protection. Same thing here in the skeletal system. We got a lot of things going on with the bones, but the main job is to support you, to give you your shape, your body weight, right? So 206 bones in your body and they determine the shape of your body. Other functions include protection, right? It's not just supporting your body weight, but it's also protecting you. Your bones in your head protect your brain. The sphenoid bone protects your pituitary gland, right? The vertebrae protect your spinal cord. In the thoracic cavity, we have our sternum, our ribs, also our vertebrae that protect our heart and lungs. Movement is also very, very key when we discuss the skeletal system. And yes, we typically think of muscles when we think of movement, right? And we're going to have two full chapters on muscle contraction and, and the different muscles in the body, but the muscles have to pull on something. They have to have a starting point and an end point, or they have to have an anchor. And what they're anchoring to are your bones, specifically when we're talking about skeletal muscle. So if you have your biceps brachii muscle, for example, flex your biceps, you'll realize what's moving is the elbow joint because it's pulling on the radius bone. So if you remove that radius bone, your biceps has nothing to attach to, your muscle does not work. So you gotta have the bones in this equation. Mineral storage, we're gonna have all sorts of different cool minerals stored inside of your bone. The main one, the most important one by far, we're gonna spend a good amount of time talking about calcium. Calcium, calcium, calcium. Very important mineral inside of your bones and throughout your body and your bloodstream. And then last but not least, we'll talk a little bit about hematopoiesis. Hemato means blood, poiesis means to create. So we are gonna be creating our blood cells inside of the bones, specifically in something called bone marrow. So we'll talk about all of these cool, unique functions. But remember, primary function, big picture, supporting your body weight. Your skeleton is what's giving you your supporting frame throughout your body. Next, let's dive into bone types. So there are two major ways of classifying bones. The first one I'm not going to cover in this chapter. We're going to cover in chapter 7 and 8 when we discuss the, the location of the bones. So we have the axial skeleton in the middle of the body. And then we have the appendicular skeleton, which are basically all of your arm and leg bones. The second way we can classify bones is a little easier. It's just, what do they look like? What, what is the shape of the bone? So let's move on to the next slide and start talking about that. When categorizing bones by their shape, there are five different types. So in no particular order, the first one is called a long bone. And don't overthink this. It's not rocket science. A long bone is just a long bone. It's just long and skinny. So it's longer than it is wide. And a great example of that right here is your femur bone. And if I just kind of trace the outline of that femur bone, you get this really long rectangle looking thing. So you get this in pretty much all of the bones in your arms and legs, almost. Uh, your upper arm bone, your lower arm bones, even your metacarpals and your fingers are all considered long bones. Also, we just outlined the femur. Your shin bones are also very long and skinny. And then your metatarsals and your toe bones also would fall into this category of being a long bone. 
So stick to the extremities or the limbs and more than likely you have long bones. The only exception to that rule is the ankle and the wrist. The carpal bones in the wrist and the tarsal bones in the ankle, they are more box-like. They are more cube-like. If you take a look at the picture on the bottom right aspect of the image, what you'll see is we're looking at a bunch of tarsal bones and they all kind of have this uh, cube or triangular looking shape. I'm just kind of highlighting a few of them. So those are definitely not long, right? If anything, they're very, very tiny. So we call those short bones, just the opposite of long. And as I mentioned, the area where you're going to find this is in the carpals and the tarsals. Our next category are flat bones and flat bones are just flat bones, pretty, pretty thin. Uh, you find this in a few areas. Number one is your breastbone, your sternum. You can see this in the upper left part of the picture highlighted in green, rather flat bone. Also, a lot of the bones are that are on the outside of your skull that, per, that make your skull cavity, such as the frontal bone and the parietal bone are, are great examples of flat bones. Irregular bones is what, what it sounds like. They're irregular. They're kind of weird and they don't really fit into these first three categories. They're not long, they're not really short, and they're definitely not flat. So, in the picture, the illustration is pointing to a vertebra, a bone in your spine. And you can see, you can't really classify it as long. It's definitely not long and skinny. It's definitely not flat because we got these weird process things sticking out everywhere. And it's not short because some of these bones are pretty big and they have long processes, as I just mentioned. So other examples of this are your weird hip bones, um, the ilium, ischium, pubis, your bones inside of your skull cavity, such as the sphenoid bone, the ethmoid bone, very, very weird. You can make the argument that bones like your mandible can fall under irregular. Uh, your ear bones, your ossicles, very, very irregular. The, the three tiny bones in your ear, really weird looking. And then last but not least, we have the sesamoid bones. And the sesamoid bones, as you can read in the notes, are weird bones that develop in tendons, which means you are not born with these. Or if you are, your, your skeletal system was a little overactive during uh, mom's pregnancy. But when we're born, your knee area is pretty much all cartilage. And as we age, that cartilage eventually ossifies. And what that means is it turns into bone. So you're born without kneecaps, you're born without a patella, and as this bone grows inside of this tendon and throughout the tendon, that's what we call a sesamoid bone. Now, as you can see, a patella is the only one that everybody has. Most every person on earth has a kneecap, right? Or at least they're, they're most, they grow one as they age. Now, there are some situations where folks can have sesamoid bones in the first phalange of their either their hand or their foot. So your big toe, some folks can have phalanges right where that metatarsal meets the proximal phalange, the first part of your big toe. Some folks can also get this in the thumb region where your thumb kind of meets your metacarpal bones. And usually these are asymptomatic. They don't cause pain or discomfort. A lot of times they're just picked up on x-ray on accident. Um, but some folks have the tendency to develop these extra bones. So not everybody has 206 bones in the body. Some folks have a couple more. And it's nothing abnormal. It's nothing to worry about. It's just more ossified or calcified tissue. Just extra bone is all. So now that we covered the five categories, this is a great review slide for us to kind of just put this practice into application. So I have six pictures here for you and I want you to pause the video, if you will, and answer what type of bone does, is the following or what categories do these fall under? So label your paper one through six or label or, you know, in your head, whatever, and then hit the play button when you're ready to go over the answers. All right. Now that you're ready to go over the answers. We'll talk about number one first. Number one is a really <laughs> weird looking bone. That's your sphenoid bone, right? Weird butterfly bat looking thing. And 
that bone is definitely not long. It's definitely not short. It's it's uh, definitely irregular, right? That is an irregular bone. It's probably the uh, epitome of irregularness. So I'll put IR for irregular. Number two, what type of bones are we looking at here? We are looking at the metacarpal bones, the very long and skinny bones that make up the back of your hand, that make up the palm region. And I kind of just gave away the answer, didn't I? They're long and skinny, and therefore they are long bones. Number three, we're looking at the frontal bone. The frontal bone is the big bone that makes up your forehead, protects your brain. And any bones mainly on the outside of the skull, as I mentioned, along with the sternum, are flat. Right? Hit yourself in the forehead, and it's a pretty, for the most part, pretty flat bone. Number four, what bone are we looking at near that ankle joint? We're looking at the talus bone. And the talus bone, along with the calcaneus and the navicular and cuboid and all these other weird tarsal bones, are very, very short. They're cube-like, triangular-like. So anything in the wrist or ankle is going to fall under the short bone category. Number five, we're looking at our kneecaps. We're looking at the patella. And remember, this is the unique exception. It's not considered irregular because it is kind of a short bone, right? It's kind of this uh, circular, triangular looking structure. Uh, so, but because it develops later in life, embedded in that tendon, we call it a sesamoid bone. Patellas, that really, really unique bone. And then last but not least, number six, we're looking at the femurs, the longest, largest, arguably strongest bones in the entire body. And if you notice, it's a very long and skinny bone because your legs are long and skinny. So this would also be a long bone. And you can do this for all 206 bones in the body. Right. Take, take the ear bones, take your ribs, take your vertebrae, take your fingers and toes, uh, take your your hyoid, your jawbone, whatever. And you can classify all of them. Now, some are going to have more than one answer. Right. Your scapula bone, for example, you can make the argument the scapula bone is flat. You can also make the argument that it's irregular because it's got the spine and the acromion sticking out. Right. But most of these can fall under one category. So I encourage you to review all of your bones and figure out which category it falls under. Next section, we're going to be talking about bone structure and get some anatomy down before we talk about the physiology part. Recall back to chapter four, the tissues, when we talked about the two different types of bones from a microscopic standpoint. We had on the outside, we had something called compact bone. And remember when we cut open compact bone, it kind of just looked like a bunch of concentric rings or like a tree, if you were to look at it inside of a tree, right? And then the inside stuff we called spongy bone, also known as cancellous bone. Now I say that because remember, we have those two different types. And when I'm going to introduce these terms such as diaphysis and epiphysis, you're going to see some of these terms pop up again. So let's talk about this first term on your slide, the diaphysis. What the diaphysis is, is simply the long skinny part of your long bones. So we're going to start with the anatomy of the long bones because they have a one or two more parts compared to the other bones. And also a good amount of your bones in your body are long bones. Remember all the bones in your fingers, your hand, your lower arm and your upper arm are all long bones. And then working your way down to the lower extremity, your femur bone and your upper leg, which is what we're looking at in this picture here. The bones in your lower leg, the bones in your foot, the bones in your toes are all long bones. So once again, diaphysis is that long skinny part of that shaft. Now on the outside portion of this bone, what we have is the compact bone with all those concentric rings. So this is more of the superficial part of the diaphysis. And then inside of this bone, of these long skinny bones, is a hollow opening, is a hollow shaft. And depending on your age, you're going to have a different type of bone marrow. If you're a kid, you're going to have something called red bone marrow. 
And if you're an adult, we're going to have something called yellow bone marrow. So if you follow my green arrow inside of this bone, you can see that there's yellow tissue that's trying to resemble yellow bone marrow. So we're looking at an adult bone here. And we'll talk about the differences between red and yellow bone marrow later on in the chapter. So yellow bone marrow inside of the shaft, at least in an adult. Let's move on to the epiphysis. Now in your notes it says epiphyses because there are two of them on these long bones. The epiphysis is simply the part that's really not long and skinny, it's the ends of the bones. So this area right here is what we call the proximal epiphysis, and then this area right here, the end part, would be the distal epiphysis on this specific bone. And this area is mainly composed of that cancellous bone or that spongy bone. And if you just take a look at the opening right here, it's pretty much all spongy. Now, on the outside, though, there's still compact bone. It's just a little thinner. It's just not as, as much. It's On the inside, it's completely filled with that spongy bone instead of it, the uh, bone marrow cavity. Now, you do have bone marrow all throughout that bone, but remember, it's just going to be a little different. Instead of hollow, we're going to have that spongy bone where we're going to have this, uh, and it literally looks like a sponge or a coral reef. We're just going to have all these kind of intertwining and weaving structures uh, of bone and interspersed throughout all those holes in the sponge coral reef looking thing is where the bone marrow is going to be housed. So the big difference in the diaphysis and epiphysis, the, the diaphysis, it's hollow. It's just a big block of bone marrow. In the epiphysis, there's just these hundreds and hundreds of little pores and openings all throughout, and that's where that bone marrow is housed. Moving right along to the articular cartilage. Anytime you see the word articular or articulation, that's referring to a joint. So, and believe it or not, you already know the answer to this. We're going to have cartilage protecting the very edges of these bones, the epiphyses of these bones. So I'm highlighting it in red here. You have cartilage on both ends of the epiphyses protecting this area. And what kind of cartilage do you think it is? Do you think it's elastic cartilage, fibrocartilage, or hyaline? And as we talked about in chapter four, when in doubt, go with hyaline, right? By far the most popular, most abundant cartilage in the body. And you would be correct. It's hyaline cartilage and it provides that smooth glass layer of protection, just cushions those joints, make sure that we're not rubbing bone on bone and having awful painful arthritis. Here are some more anatomical terms of long bone that we need to discuss. So first is the periosteum. Uh, you're going to see the word osteum and os osseous and osteo, all these different oste something. That's always going to be referring to some type of bone tissue. And then peri means around or surrounding. So the periosteum is a tissue that surrounds the bones. And it's pretty much all throughout the bone except at the very edges of the epiphysis where the cartilage is. So around the edge of the epiphysis and then all throughout the diaphysis is this tissue called periosteum. And what is it? It's a protective tissue mainly just made up of a whole bunch of dense collagen fibers. And recall back to chapter four, what is the purpose of our collagen fibers? And hopefully you're saying strength, right? Exactly. Strength. So we have these strong proteins to protect the outside of our bone tissue. And some of these collagen fibers actually penetrate to the underlying bone and kind of connect it. They're called Sharpies fibers, and it's just basically to make the bone even stronger than it already is. So you got strong bone plus strong protein equals really, really strong, right? And they also connect to the tendons so those muscles can attach. Remember, a tendon attaches a muscle to a bone. And they contain blood vessels. So with epithelial tissue and with cartilage, we, we talked about how those, when they get damaged, we have to do something. 
either we have to make more cells or we're going to have problems, right? So with epithelial tissue, they were avascular, but they were highly mitotic. We talked about cartilage being damaged because of the poor blood supply source, and that's kind of a problem, right? Because we don't always grow new cartilage all the time. With bones, no big deal. You can break your bones. Go fall out of a tree. Go get hit with a hockey stick or whatever. Fall off your bike. You can break a lot of bones in your body, and they will heal. And sometimes they'll heal actually stronger than before, even better than before. Um, and it's because of all the tissues in this area having a lot, a lot of blood flow. A lot of oxygen and nutrients are going to help heal this tissue. So on the next slide, I'm going to show you a picture of all these structures, the periosteum. And then the next topic is the medullary cavity. So anytime you see the word medullary or medulla, that means inside or deep inside or in the very middle. So we're going to have this word a lot, especially next semester. Um, later this semester, we'll talk about the medulla of the brain. That's the inner portion of your brain. We're going to talk about the adrenal medulla, the inside of the adrenal gland, the medulla of the kidney, inside of the kidney, and you get the theme here. It means inside. So this is that hollow cavity where the bone marrow is found in that diaphysis. And what we call this is the medullary cavity, or you can just say the medulla of the bone. But because it is an open space, technically, it's more correct to say medullary cavity. And then last but not least, we have the endosteum. And the endosteum, endo, means inside or within, right? So this is a lining, lining that hollow cavity. So it's basically a protective lining coating the medullary cavity where that bone marrow is. So let's move on to the next picture and I'll show you an illustration so we can kind of tie this all together. So here's an illustration of the terms that we just talked about and you can see on the picture on the left that the periosteum is just this area kind of covering the outside portion of the bone. Once again mainly made up of collagen fibers just to keep everything together and protect it, strength. And then if you look at the picture in the middle, this is where we'll see that medullary cavity right here. And we're going to have bone marrow. And then in the spongy bone, you can see all these red dots everywhere. That's also going to be bone marrow in the epiphysis. And you look at the picture on the right, what we're zooming in on is the lining between the really the outside and the inside part of the bone. So you see this in the medullary cavity. You also just see this basically surrounding spongy bone and that's what we're looking at here it's these tiny little cells that are lining all of this spongy bone and you might see some other cells and terms that we've talked about before in the tissues chapter you see the word osteocyte you see lacuna that should look somewhat familiar you see osteoclast and osteoblast you see the word matrix we've talked about what a matrix is right it's just the non-living cells part of the tissue so some of this should be a good review for you. And we'll talk more about those in just a bit. So big picture, let's take a step back and just kind of put all these new terms together. We have a little matching practice for you here. So number one is the epiphysis. And remember the epiphysis is the not long and skinny part, right? And the way I always remembered it in school is E for epiphysis, E for ends. So these are the ends of the long bones. So with our letters A through F, we just need to find which one matches that definition. So A, hyaline cartilage. Yeah, hyaline cartilage is covering the epiphysis, but you see the answer, right? I mean, you see the word within the answer, so that's not it. B is the shaft, so long skinny part. No, that doesn't really fit. C, hollow space. It's not a hollow space, right? It's the ends of the bones, so C doesn't fit. D says the white outer covering of bones containing blood vessels. That's not the, out, the outer covering. Remember, peri means around, so that's going to be more periosteum. And then at E, we arrive with ends of long bones, so that makes sense. And that's going to be composed of our cancellous bone. So let's put a nice E there. And then we can move on. The medullary cavity, we saw that hollow space in letter C. So that makes sense. We'll put that there. 
Number three, we saw the white outer covering of bone. That's protecting the bone. A lot of blood flow, as I mentioned. That's going to be letter D. So now process of elim elimination, we're getting a little closer. Diaphysis, remember that's the long skinny part. So we also call that the shaft of the bone. So you see that in letter B. And then we're just down to our last two. So we have A and F. And if you read A, it says hyaline cartilage, right? Covering the long bones. So that's going to kind of match the articular cartilage, right? And then we're left with number five, the endosteum. Endo means inside. And as you can read the definition here, a thin membrane lining the medullary cavity. And the medullary cavity, remember, is in the inside, medial or middle part of the bone. And therefore, that matches. So endosteum would be the letter F. And then by default, articular cartilage is always going to be hyaline cartilage. So hopefully your answer is matched up with mine. Let's keep on learning new material with the bones. Let's keep moving. Now that we've covered long bone, let's throw in all the other types of bone regarding short, irregular, flat, sesamoid bones, all that. It's the exact same anatomy. Okay. The only difference is we don't have a long skinny shaft. We don't have a diaphysis because it's not long. And therefore, we don't really have epiphyses either. But everything else we talked about is still fair game. If you take a look at this picture here, you have the periosteum surrounding the outside of the bone. There we go. We have the outside of the bone called compact bone, right? And that's on either side of the bone. And then inside of the bone is where that bone marrow is going to be housed within that spongy bone. So all these holes that you see in this picture, that is where your red bone marrow is typically going to be found. So everything's the same. Nothing changes. We're still going to have all the cells. We're going to have osteoblasts and osteoclasts and all the cells. The only difference is we just don't have a diaphysis and an epiphysis that we can label. So what is bone tissue actually made up of? Since it's tissue, we know it's made up of cells, right? Cells build tissues, tissues build organs. And because it's a connective tissue, we're gonna have a lot of matrix. And dispersed throughout that matrix, we're gonna have a lot of different proteins. So with the composition of bone, there are two types of components. There's inorganic components and organic components. And remember the definition, what's the difference between these? Organic components has carbon that's bound to other carbon or hydrogen atoms. And inorganic is lacking carbon. But these are both very, very, very important. Typically what we think of with bone strength and hardness is we think of calcium, or at least that's what I thought when I went to school or before school even. And yes, that, that is very, very important. Calcium is one of the main, main ingredients of bone tissue, but you can't have calcium and lack in the other things to have strong bones. You have to have a balance of all of this stuff. So there's carbs, there's proteins, there's everything. So it's not just one thing. You take out organic versus inorganic, the bone's going to fall apart. So let's talk about the minerals, the inorganic compounds or yeah, inorganic components first. So as I mentioned, calcium, very, very important. We're also gonna have phosphate groups. And when you combine those two together, what we get is this really, really, really strong structure called hydroxyapatite. And my mouse is messing up a little bit, sorry. Hydroxyapatite. And what this is, is just kind of a concoction between calcium and phosphate groups. We have like about 10 calciums to around six or so phosphate groups. And it just makes this really, really, really hard substance. And that's what gives your bones its strength, this hydroxyapatite. It's why bones are the strongest thing in the entire human body. Now, when you move to the organic components, though, we're going to have a lot of carbs and a lot of proteins, as I mentioned. So a balanced diet is important for healthy, strong bones. And a lot of these proteins are simply just going to be collagen fibers. 
and the collagen fibers are just going to connect everything together, especially it's actually going to be intertwined and interweaving with this hydroxyapatite to hold it all together and make it really, really tough and strong. And we're also going to have some other cool things floating around in the extracellular matrix uh, that it's called chondroitin and glucosamine maybe you've heard of that with folks who are suffering from arthritis and joint pain that kind of thing they're just parts of the substance the, the matrix in your bone that helps just make it really really strong so main ingredients are your calcium and phosphates and that combined forms this hydroxyapatite mineral compound so hydroxyapatite as you can see in the notes two-thirds of the bone matrix of the, of the bone matrix the majority of the bone matrix is hydroxyapatite and that's what gives us its toughness all right so this slide should look very very familiar we've covered almost all of this in chapter four when we introduced a compact bone so just a quick review the Havergian system is also known as the osteon, and what that is is the circular unit all throughout the compact bone. So in this picture on top, what I'm doing is I'm circling a lot of the Havergian systems or the osteons. Inside, and then you can also see the micrograph below. That would be an osteon. So inside of the osteon, de usually dead smack in the middle, is an opening, and we call that opening the Haversian Canal, also known as the Central Canal, and that's where our blood vessels and our nerves are going to be coming out of. And then everything pretty much surrounding that Central Canal is going to be referred to as lamellae or lamella. And then all throughout the lamella, we have those small black slits, those black dots that you see all throughout the microscope picture. Those are the lacunae, and that's where those osteocytes, those mature bone cells hang out. And then we have the canaliculi, and the canaliculi are just a really, really small channels that all lead to the central canal. So if this is not quite ringing a bell, make sure you go back to the chapter four video, chapter four notes. We've covered pretty much all of this already. And when discussing cancellous bone, please remember that the other name for this is spongy bone. And spongy bone consists of these rib-like or these uh, coral reef looking structures. The actual bone tissue itself, so the stuff that I am highlighting in purple right now, that is called trabeculae. So that's the actual bone tissue. The spaces between the trabeculae is where the bone marrow is found, specifically the red bone marrow. So we have pretty much everything similar to this area. We have lacuna and lacuna, excuse me, we have osteocytes, we have osteoclasts, osteoblasts, we have lamellae, canaliculi. The only thing we don't have is the actual osteon. We don't have that really neat central canal. And the reason why is because the blood vessels are found everywhere. They're just weaving in and out of all of these spaces along with that bone marrow. So big difference from a structural standpoint is osteons and central canals or haversian systems and haversian canals are only found in compact bone, not cancellous or spongy bone. And then this bottom bullet is just showing you if we were to zoom in right here. So as soon as you crack the periosteum, you're in the bone marrow. So it doesn't take much to get to the bone marrow in that area. Next topic, we're going to be reintroducing those bone cells. We've already talked about them, right? We talked about osteocytes and blasts and class. And then we'll talk about bone marrow and how bones grow. So as I mentioned, these three types of cells should look familiar. We did cover them in Chapter 4. But let's go into a little bit more detail as we review them. So remember osteoblasts, we said B for blast. And we said B for build, right? So we are building tissue. We said osteoclasts do the exact opposite of building. So we said C4 clast, C4 chew or crush or collapse, whatever word you want to use. 
And then we said osteocytes are those mature osteoblasts. Basically, they just kind of get trapped as they get older. And really, they just kind of hang out in the bone tissue. They do still have a job, but they're just not as active as those osteoblasts and osteoclasts are. All right, so where are these things found? Let's go back up to the top. The osteoblasts, very important for bone growth and bone remodeling, is the osteoblasts are primarily found in the periosteum which once again, this is the outside part of the bone. This is where all those collagen fibers are. So as we build bones, as our bones heal from a fracture, as we get bigger and stronger, as we grow taller, generally speaking, what we're doing is we're strengthening the outside part of the bone with those osteoblasts. Now, are osteoblasts found elsewhere? Yes, of course, but primarily they're just on this outside portion of the bone. The osteoclasts, however, are found on the inside part of the bone. They're lining that medullary cavity along the endosteum. So what we're going to get with this phenomenon is as our bones get taller and wider, as we grow our bone tissue growing up, what's going to happen is we are actually going to chew from the inside out and we're going to make more space for that bone marrow cavity, that medullary cavity. And then we're going to build it's stronger on the outside. So yes, osteoclasts, even though we're chewing and breaking down and destroying, we're basically doing that so we can build it stronger on the outside. So picture doing a home remodel or if you're fixing a, a car, we need to take out some of the stuff on the inside, right? We might have to knock down a bathroom wall here or we might need to take out these spark plugs here and then we'll build it stronger. We'll build a better wall, a thicker wall, or we'll build something new in the car. You get my analogy here. So the osteoclasts are very important. We do need to break down in order to build efficiently. And then the osteocytes, where are they located? Well, it depends on what type of bone we're talking about. If it's compact bone, they're found in those little black slits all throughout the lamellae. They're called lacunae, or lacuna is one. And then in cancellous bone, or spongy bone, they're found in the actual bone tissue. They're just embedded within that trabeculae. So let's move on to the next slide. I'll show you a picture, kind of give you an illustration of these types of cells. So really, really good picture. I, I love how the illustration is giving you shapes of these cells, but also the location. The location is really cool too. For example, look at the osteoblasts and notice that it's coming from the very, very outside. It's coming from that periosteum area. And once again, what these do is they just secrete that hydroxyapatite. They just spit out bone matrix. They spit out all the calcium and the phosphates and they make your bones bigger and stronger. The osteocytes are just found everywhere. They can be found within a compact bone they can be found in, in the in the lacunae, excuse me, and they can be found inside the trabeculae in spongy bone. Let's move over to the far right. We'll talk about osteoclasts. Once again, notice where they're located in the top picture in the bone. They are located on the inside, lining that medullary cavity in the endosteum. And notice they got a cool, unique structure to them. They're a little differently shaped than the osteoblasts. So what they actually do is something called resorb bone, which they actually break down bone. They secrete these really, really strong hydrogen ions and enzymes and actually kind of it's, it's an acid is what it is. And it basically just burns your bone and dissolves your bone tissue from the inside out. But once again, this is an essential process of growing and healing for that matter. So we do need this. And then the third picture here is the osteogenic cell. We haven't discussed that yet, but that's just the stem cell, uh, and that's what's actually going to make these osteoblasts. So some osteogenic cells, they, they go through mitosis, and they actually become osteoblasts. And then as the osteoblasts do their job and they get older, they can actually become osteocytes. So it kind of goes in that order. Now the osteoclasts are kind of left out of this equation, the osteoclasts are basically just macrophages. So they're actually coming from the bone marrow. They're coming more from like the immune system in itself, not so much the actual bone bone tissue, these osteogenic cells.
Okay, everyone, this is a very important slide, very big topic in this chapter. So if you are getting a little tired and need to stretch a little bit, I'd encourage you to pause the video, kind of reset your mind, do, do whatever you need to do, and then come back when you're fresh, because uh, this is one of a, a, it's a very, very important physiological concept within bone homeostasis and blood homeostasis. So... Let's get started. Calcium, as I mentioned, is very, very, very important. We have to have a very small window of calcium in the bloodstream at all times. And if that window gets too small or that number gets below the normal window, or if it gets higher than the normal window, we have some severe, severe issues going on. So. To repeat that, what, what I'm saying is in your blood, you have a certain amount of calcium floating around. To be specific, just to give you an idea, you don't need to know this exact range, but it's very small, 9 to 11 milligrams per deciliter, which is a very small amount. So if we're at 7 or 8 milligrams per deciliter, yeah, we're kind of close. Well, guess what? We're in really, really big trouble even though we're, yeah, kind of close. If we're at 11.5 or 12 milligrams per deciliter, we're in really, really big trouble. So at all times, we need to make sure our blood calcium is between 9 to 11 milligrams per deciliter in order for proper function. Now, proper function of what? Well, kind of everything. Uh, your muscles, <laughs> your nerves, your, your kidneys, your guts, um, even such stuff as such as clotting, uh, PMAT, the mitotic phases, uh, all of that depends on having the right amount of calcium in your body. So if we have too much calcium in the blood, that's a problem. The body needs to fix that and fix that rather quickly. So because calcium is so important, because we have to always monitor this homeostatic window of 9 to 11, we're not going to waste this stuff. We're not just going to get rid of it and hope that I drink my milk products or eat a bunch of yogurt and cheese or my spinach and kale salad for dinner. The body's not going to depend on you having a balanced diet. It's going to take matters into its own hands. So if we have too much calcium in the blood, once again, we don't get rid of it. We don't pee it out. We don't poop it out and we don't really sweat it out either. We don't really get rid of it that well because we have a really, really good place inside the body that can use this calcium. And what I'm talking about is your bones. If we have too much calcium in the blood, cool, no big deal. Let's store it in the bones temporarily. We'll put it in the bank. And then when we need that calcium later, in case our blood calcium levels are too low, we can just go to the bank and take out our calcium. No big deal, right? Exactly. So if the blood calcium is too low, we can just leach the bone. So what kind of cells are going to be doing that? And you should already have an idea, right? If we are storing calcium in the bone tissue, those are going to be the osteoblast cells, right? Building bone. If we need to go to the bank and withdraw calcium. If we need to take calcium out of the bone and put it in the blood due to blood levels being too low, well, we need another cell to do that. And that's going to be the osteoclasts, right? They're going to break down the bone or chew the bone, and then they're going to spit that excess calcium into the bloodstream. So what can happen if this goes haywire? What can happen if we have eight milligrams per deciliter, if we're hypocalcemic uh, in, in the blood? Hypo meaning lower, right? Well, a lot of things can happen. Uh, numbness, tingling in the muscles, uh, in, in, the, in the nerve fibers, cramps and spasms in the muscles specifically, uh, seizures if it gets really, really bad, and this can drastically slow down your heart rate. So not good. Those are bad symptoms. We don't want them, right? What about on the flip side? What if calcium gets too high in the bloodstream? Well, if it gets too high in the bloodstream and you can't put any more into the bones, 
you're going to start putting calcium in other places in the body, such as your kidneys, i.e. kidney stones, right? There, a lot of them are just made up of calcium crystals. That's really bad. I've heard that's more painful than childbirth, and females have actually uh, agreed to that statement before, females who've had kids and kidney stones. Uh, other things that can happen is GI distress. You got an upset stomach, nausea, vomiting, constipation, all sorts of things. Your bones are going to be weak. If if we if we have too much calcium, you can actually that could be an osteoclastic cancer type deal where your osteoclasts are going nuts and chewing the bones too quickly, which is going to weaken them. You can have confusion, fatigue from a mental state. You can have pal heart palpitations, dizzy, fainting spells, uh, comas. You, you can die. Uh, you, it's actually very common if hypercalcemia gets out of control, 80% um, of people die within a year or so. And usually the prognosis is you're only going to live about three to four months if they can't get it under control, if it's due to like a cancer or something. So I say all that not to bore you, but to show you, to emphasize how important this is how we're going to monitor these levels and fix them. So how we're going to fix them is through a negative feedback mechanism, a hormone uh, in, involved negative feedback mechanism. So we're going to have two different hormones and they're going to fix this problem. So if the calcium's too high, we're going to release a hormone and fix it. If the calcium's too low in the blood, we're going to release a hormone and fix it. So before I introduce the hormones, let's talk about the organs or the glands where these hormones come from. So what I'm going to do is draw something called the thyroid gland and I'm going to draw the backside of the thyroid gland for you. So the thyroid gland is this cool organ right in the kind of middle of your neck, your anterior neck, and it has this kind of H butterfly looking shape to it. And it just kind of hugs right in front of your trachea area. Now on the back side of the thyroid gland, we have these multiple glands kind of in the lobes or the corners, and those are called parathyroid glands. And they work kind of separately. They, they're they're kind of just uh, renting space on the thyroid gland, but they do something totally different. So the thyroid gland has cells specific cells are called parafollicular cells and what they do is they release a hormone that stimulates osteoblasts. So let's talk about the thyroid first. So I'm going to do this in purple. The thyroid gland releases a hormone called calcitonin and that makes sense, right? We're talking about calcium, calcitonin should, you know, it fits, right? And calcitonin stimulates osteoblasts and it, by stimulating osteoblasts we're also inhibiting osteoclasts so calcitonin is involved if our blood calcium is too high if our blood calcium is too high we need to put that calcium in the bones and as we just covered what's going to build bones your osteoblasts parathyroid is an antagonist to calcitonin, which means it's an opposite effect. The parathyroid glands release parathyroid hormone. That's pretty easy to remember, right? So oftentimes we abbreviate this as PTH. It's also just known as parathormone as well. And what they do is the complete opposite. They stimulate osteoclasts. So if our blood calcium is too low and we need calcium and you don't like eating your leafy green vegetables because who does, our body has to take over and parathyroid hormone gets secreted throughout the bloodstream and it tells the bones to tell the osteoclast to get to work. The osteoclasts start chewing up the bone tissue and spit the calcium into the bloodstream to fix the problem. So before I show you the picture on the next slide, let's, let's just uh, recap this. On the left side of these bullet points, I'm going to put prob for problem. And then here in purple on the right side, it's going to be our fix. 
So if the problem is our blood calcium is too low, then we have parathyroid hormone that stimulates the osteoclast and we fix it because the osteoclasts raise the blood calcium. If our blood calcium is too high, so here's our problem, we're gonna release calcitonin to stimulate the osteoblast, which is gonna build the calcium in the bones, build the bones, which is gonna decrease our blood levels of calcium. So these are antagonistic, they're opposite. When one's going, the other one's kind of shut down. And we'll talk more about this also next semester when we introduce other cool ways parathyroid hormone affects not just the bones, but also your gut and your kidneys as well. It gets really cool. But let's move on to the next slide and I'll show you a better illustration. So great picture for you visual learners to kind of bring this all together. What I want to take your attention to first is the very middle. Remember, this is a negative feedback loop or a negative feedback mechanism. And the whole purpose of that is to maintain homeostasis. If something gets too high, we need to lower it. If something gets too low, we need to raise it, right? So in this picture, it says 10 milligrams per deciliter, which fits in that 9 to 11 range that I told you on the previous slide, right? So that's good. That's our normal. That's our homeostatic I ideal. So what happens or what we're looking at in this picture is the issues and how we fix it. So let's look at issue number one right here with this pink arrow. And what happens is if our blood calcium level gets too high, that's a problem. And we need to do something with that calcium. Once again, though, it's too important to just urinate or defecate or sweat it out. We, we want to hold on to it just in case we need it for later, which we will. So we're going to do something else with it. So what happens is the thyroid gland, I'll put a number two here, the thyroid gland releases the hormone calcitonin. And what calcitonin does is it stimulates osteoblasts and also inhibits osteoclasts. And we'll talk about the kidneys and how that works uh, next semester. But essentially what we're doing, we fix it by decreasing the blood levels. The problem here at number one was the blood levels got too high. So we fix it thanks to the hormone calcitonin. Now who's really in charge here though is PTH. PTH is gonna be uh, more of a heavy hitter. So when calcitonin is released, we just shut down a lot of PTH. And when PTH is stimulated, PTH is just really doing its thing. And calcitonin kind of a, falls in the background. But let's do a second example. What happens when our blood calcium level gets too low, according to the diagram? So we'll start here. Number one, here's the problem. Our blood calcium is too low, decreased calcium. So what we do is the parathyroid glands secrete parathyroid hormone, PTH. And what we talked about on the previous slide was PTH stimulates osteoclasts. And that's going to chew up the bone and spit that excess calcium back into the bloodstream. So our fix is we raise our bloodstream and bring it back to normal. Now, other cool things we're going to talk about next semester is the kidneys reabsorb this and bring it back into the blood. So instead of urinating, like I said, we're not going to urinate a lot of calcium out. We're going to bring that back in. And this one right here is talking about a specific part of the small intestine that does a great job of getting this reabsorbed back into the bloodstream in case we're too low. So we don't defecate it out as well. So make sure you know the relationship. Make sure you know what happens when our calcium gets too high. What gland gets stimulated? What hormone does that gland make? And what cell is being activated by that hormone? So to repeat that, make sure you know what organ is involved. Is it thyroid or parathyroid? What hormone is involved? Is it calcitonin or parathyroid hormone? And what cell is being activated, osteoblasts or osteoclasts? All right, little clinical scenario for you to kind of bridge the gap between what we just talked about and the next section. 
So we have a patient that walks into your office, Susan. She's been complaining about pain in her left foot. Yesterday she fell and broke her hip. She was diagnosed with osteoporosis, which is a condition of thinning of the bones. And this is really common in the elderly, and it's really common in the female elderly due to hormones. So explain reasons why Susan has thinning bones. Uh, well, it could be something wrong with her calcium metabolism, her calcium homeostasis, right? Maybe what's happening is she is leaking out too much calcium. Maybe her osteoclasts are going a little haywire. Maybe she has excess parathyroid hormone. And remember, PTH stimulates osteoclasts. So I'll put OC for osteoclasts. That could be thinning out her bones. Maybe she's just, it doesn't tell us her age. Maybe she's in her 80s or 90s and she's just old and the body's breaking down. And if, you're, if you have osteoporosis, she, we, it's safe to say she probably is in her 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, some, somewhere along that range. Number two, describe the mechanism for calcium control in the body. That's what we just talked about on the previous two slides, so make sure you're familiar with that. And then what are some treatments you'd recommend? Well, if her bones ha are weak due to low calcium, maybe a calcium supplement, possibly, potentially. It depends. We don't want we want to be careful and make sure her calcium isn't too raised, right, or in the blood. So even though they're low in the bone, we don't want to mess with the blood levels as well. So another treatment could be exercise. And this is the last thing Susan's going to want to do because if she's osteoporotic, if she's got weak bones, she's going to be really mad when you tell her, hey, go lift some weights or, hey, go do some walking or some weight-bearing activities. That's probably going to be somewhat painful for her. But this is one of the situations where the no pain, no gain actually – does come into play, it does make sense, um, and you actually want to put pressure on those bones without injuring yourself to make your bones stronger. So just cool little clinical situation for you. Let's move on to the next slide and we'll cover the next topic. Our next topic is involving bone marrow, which is also known as myeloid tissue. And what bone marrow, specifically red bone marrow, is going to be involved with is making all of the blood cells. So not just red blood cells, but also platelets and your white blood cells. So this is considered a connective tissue. And this is that odd tissue that we talked about in Chapter 4, the reticular tissue, that has to deal more with the immune system. Uh, anybody who's ever watched a medical episode or a show when they do bone marrow transplants or radiation to kill the bone marrow, uh, it's because the bone marrow is heavily involved with the immune system. So that's where we find the reticular connective tissue is anything involving the immune system, such as bone marrow, some lymph nodes, and your spleen. Now, where is bone marrow located? It's located everywhere. <laughs> uh, in the long bones it's found in the medullary cavity in that shaft diaphysis area it's also found within the spongy bone at the epiphyses so it's everywhere inside the bone all the other bones that aren't long it's just found throughout that trabeculae all the spaces between the trabeculae to be more accurate so remember trabeculae is the actual bone tissue and then the spaces are where all the blood vessels and the nerves and the bone marrow is located So let's talk about the difference between red bone marrow and yellow bone marrow. Red bone marrow is red in color because it functions in something called hematopoiesis, which means making your blood. Now, if you recall back to chapter four, when we studied blood as a tissue, as a connective tissue, you'll remember that 95% of the picture was just a whole bunch of red blood cells. It was just those little pink donut looking things everywhere. And we had like one or two white blood cells, and I don't even think I could find platelets in the picture. It's just there were no platelets. And that's pretty much how a normal bloodstream should look like it. Not that many platelets, very, very few white blood cells, if any, and then just covered in red blood cells. If you just take a drop of blood and put it under the microscope, that's what you should see. So because the majority of the cells in your blood are red blood cells, red bone marrow is red in color because of the, the cells. Now, in children, 
all bones, all bones have red bone marrow. Now let's think about that. There are three cells that we that I just discussed. There are the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and then the platelets. And you should know what all these do based on our uh, lecture on tissues. And you should also know their proper names, right? Erythrocytes, leukocytes, and thrombocytes in, in that order. All right, so let's think of kids. Let's think of a, a toddler or an infant, right? What are they doing all day long? They're sleeping most well. Infants sleep most of the day, right? They're constantly growing. So what you need, what do you need to grow? You need a lot of oxygen. You need a lot of nutrients. So red blood cells are getting spit out millions and millions every second, just constantly spitting out red blood cells all the time. Infants and kids and toddlers, they get sick all the time, right? If you're not sick, maybe, maybe there is something wrong with you. Kids always got runny noses. They always have ear infections. They always have a sore throat, right? And it's because their immune system isn't really well developed. Yes, they, they can get some from a natural birth and they can get some antibodies and the mom's immune system from breastfeeding. But at the same time, after six months, the immune system's kind of on its own and kids get sick. They put their hands everywhere. They eat sand. They eat dirt. They eat uh, stuff on the floor. They, they put everything in their mouth. They always touch their eyes. They're always getting sick. That's somewhat normal. So what do we need as an infant is we need to make a lot of white blood cells to fight these infections and develop an immunity to all sorts of bacteria and viruses and fungus and all that stuff. So we're making a lot of white blood cells. And then last but not least, platelets, right? Kids can fall uh, or you know, even if they're just started crawling, they can run into something that's sharp, start bleeding, and they need to make sure that they have enough platelets to clot that blood so they don't bleed out because they don't have as much blood as you and I do. Right? We, we have four or five liters of blood if we, you're a grown adult listening to this lecture. Kids don't have four to five liters of blood. They're smaller. So when they bleed, it's a little bit more of a big deal. So we need to fix that and clot that blood. So I say all that because that is the reason why all 206 bones in the body pretty much have red bone marrow as kids. Now, once we start getting to age five, age six, some of that red bone marrow starts turning in to yellow bone marrow because we're not growing at, well, we're still growing as much, but by then we are, our immune system is somewhat established and we have more blood in our body. So the platelets can, uh, they, they can be a little delayed and we're not going to worry about bleeding out or hemorrhaging. Right? And then as you get older and older and older, that number continues to go down. You don't need as many red blood cells. Your white blood cell immune system is established. Same thing with the platelets. So by the time we're fully grown adults, we're pretty much mostly yellow bone marrow. Everywhere throughout the diaphyses of the long bones. And there's only a few select places where we have red bone marrow. And I do want you to know these select locations here at the bottom of the slide. So the flat bones of the skull, where are those or what are those? Those are the bones on the outside of your head, right? The frontal bone, the parietal bone, the occipital bone, pretty good examples. Uh, other flat bones, sternum. You also find a little bit of red bone marrow in the ribs and in the vertebrae. You find red bone marrow in the pelvic bones and generally the proximal epiphysis of the humerus and femur, not so much the distal. So with the proximal epiphysis of the humerus, we're talking about the shoulder area, and with the proximal epiphysis of the femur, we're talking more about the hip area. So these are the locations, and everywhere else, you know, around your knee, around your ankle, your hands, your feet, your elbows, all that stuff, you're going to have pretty much yellow bone marrow. And we'll talk about yellow bone marrow on the next slide. So red bone marrow was mainly red because of all those red blood cells and yellow bone marrow is mainly yellow because it's mainly comprised of fat of adipose tissue. And remember what adipose tissue looked like under the microscope. It's just a bunch of these honeycomb or oval looking sacs of lipids and it gives off kind of a yellow appearance. And once again, this is mainly in most adult bones. 
So once we turn five, this transformation starts happening from red to yellow. And then as we're fully aged, our bones are mainly yellow bone marrow. Now, what is the point of this though? Why would we want fat inside of our bones? Well, there is a point to everything in the human body. Nothing is just there randomly, right? So with yellow bone marrow, remember fat is a really good energy storage. So just in case we have to starve ourselves, just in case we run out of food or we get stuck on a deserted island, we have some time. We have some serious emergency backup supplies. You're going to break down all the sugar in your blood. Then you're going to break down all the glycogen in your liver and muscles. And then you can start breaking down fat on your belly and fat around your arms and your hips. And then you can start breaking down fat around other organs and you can start tapping into bone marrow. So you have this mechanism to where you can live two, three, four months without food and still be living and be fine. You might not feel good, but you'll be okay. So this is more of a survival mechanism. It's just energy storage for really, really severe situations. In our next topic, we're going to cover bone formation and development. So when we're a developing fetus, we start turning some of the cartilage into bone tissue. And even when we're born, we're really, really mushy. We're mainly made up of cartilage. Those bones are really, really soft. And as we age and mature, they just become harder and harder and harder. Now, the process of making cartilage into bone is called ossification or calcification. And another way of saying that is simply osteogenesis. So we call it calcification because remember the main ingredient of that hydroxyapatite is calcium. And with this osteogenesis, we're just going to be using both osteoblasts and class to build and break down, to build and break down until we get our final desired product. So for the next few slides, we're going to talk about the two types of ossification or calcification that occurs. One is called intramembranous ossification. And then another one, or we shorten that as IM ossification. And then another one is called endochondral ossification. And usually that's not shortened, but I'm shortening it, calling it EC ossification. So you'll see that on the next two few slides, IM and endochondral ossification. So as we're developing bone as a fetus and a very, very young infant, there's two foundations on how we can make or build this bone. One is with embryonic tissue, something that's called mesenchyme, which is basically just specialized connective tissue that can develop into all sorts of different things such as bone and cartilage. The other one is just cartilage tissue. We're basically going to turn hyaline cartilage into bone. So for this one, this first ossification is called intramembranous ossification, also known as IM ossification. And this, IM, there we go. This is going to use that embryonic tissue, that mesenchyme. So say that we're building a house. You can build your house on a slab of concrete, or you can build your house on, you can dig into the ground and make a crawl space kind of deal, right? So here we're going to be using the, well, it doesn't matter what example, but here we're going to be using the mesenchyme, the embryonic tissue. And this is how flat bones form. So the bones of your skull and your sternum are formed from this process called IM ossification. So let's look at a few of the steps and see what's going on here. What we have, and I'm going to show you this picture on, on the next slide. I'm going to show you this picture zoomed up or zoomed in or blown up a little bit so you can see. But we have these ossification centers where basically these are designated areas where we're going to grow the bone. And we're going to grow it from the inside out. So we're going to start growing the spongy bone first. And then we're going to lay down the compact bone second. So what happens is... We have stem cells that turn into those osteogenic cells, and then osteogenic cells eventually form osteoblasts. And those osteoblasts start making the matrix. They start secreting all of that bone tissue. And that bone tissue becomes calcified. 
And as I mentioned, we're going to start from the inside out. So we're going to build the spongy bone first. We're going to build the trabeculae first. And then after that, we're going to make it a sandwich. And on either side of the trabeculae, we're going to start building the compact bone. And then we're just going to continue to grow out from there. So we're basically growing outside out, if you will. And then we'll have the periosteum established and nice healthy bone. So once again, this is called intramembranous ossification. We're using stem cells. We're using something embryonic tissue to help form these flat bones. So the bones in your skull form, develop very differently than the bones in your arms and legs. But at the end of the day, when we're adults and we're done forming, the tissue is pretty much identical. You have compact bone on the outside and you have spongy bone on the inside. So here we're just talking about how we develop is different. So let's move on to the next slide and I'll show you a picture, the same picture, just blown up a little bit. Once again, intramembranous ossification is using an embryonic connective tissue as its foundation and we're just going to be building bone from the inside out. So what we're going to do is just go picture by picture, left to right. You start in this picture in the top left corner. What you have here in the circle is something called an ossification center. And that's just an area where we're going to be develop, developing this bone tissue. What we have are a bunch of osteogenic cells. And what they do is they are eventually going to form a bunch of osteoblasts. You can see the osteoblasts are these little cuboidal looking cells on the outside. And they're going to start building the bone tissue. They're going to start secreting that ground substance or that matrix and you get to picture three and you can see the spongy bone is starting to be developed. You can see the trabeculae and then all the blood vessels weaving in and out of that trabeculae, the holes within the trabeculae. And then our final product is we have our spongy bone fully developed and we're starting to develop our compact bone. And I'm showing you the compact bone in green the best I can. There we go. And then from there, we're going to continue to develop the compact bone and the periosteum, and you have your bones. Now, this only takes place in really flat bones, so specifically the skull is what we want you to know. The skull bones and then the collar bones, another weird one. But pretty much every other bone from the head down, on the next slide, we're going to cover something called endochondral ossification, and that's pretty much the rest of the bones in your body. They grow in this fashion. So intramembranous ossification used that embryonic tissue as the foundation to build the bone on. Here we're going to be using cartilage, specifically hyaline cartilage as our foundation. So endochondral ossification, endo means inside and chondral means cartilage. So like I said, pretty much everything other than the skull bones and, and the collar bones are going to be using this mechanism. And same thing as before, I know the picture on the right is very, very small. I'm going to blow it up on the next slide so you can see it a little better. But really all we're going to have here is a big cartilage model and you can see this very first picture. Looks like a bone, looks like a little immature bone, but it's really just 100% cartilage. And what we're going to do is we're going to start getting those osteogenic cells to make osteoblasts and those osteoblasts are going to start secreting their matrix and start making that cartilage hard, start calcifying it. And what we're going to do is, yes, we're actually going to make bone all throughout the middle and kind of work our way towards the end. So we're going to start in the middle of the diaphysis and then work our way towards each epiphysis. But remember, we have to have that medullary cavity in the middle of those long bones. We have to have somewhere for the bone marrow to go. So what's going to happen next is those osteoclasts are going to come in and start reshaping and literally chewing and chowing down on some of the bone to make it look just right. And then what we're going to do, as I mentioned, we're going to start from the middle of the diaphysis and work our way towards the epiphysis. And at the very end, when all is said and done, the entire bone is going to be bone, except for the area right between the epiphysis and the diaphysis. And this is what we call the growth plate. And the growth plate is also known, as you can see, I just circled it, as the epiphyseal plate. And this is what's going to allow us to grow 
continually through puberty and, and until we're done growing. So this endochondral ossification, we're talking about how bones are formed in the fetus and how we're, they're formed as an infant and a baby. By age seven, this whole process is pretty much done, but you're not done growing at age seven, right? Hopefully, hopefully you're still going to get a lot, lot taller between age seven and age whatever, 16, 18, 20. So we still need to allow the long bones to grow, and how they grow is through the growth plate, and we'll talk about how that actually works in just a second. But let's move on to the next slide, and I'll zoom in on this picture for you to show you this process. So with this photo, you can see that at the starting point, pretty much we're dealing with just cartilage. You can see it's, it's going to look like a bone. It's going to eventually become a bone. You can see the long skinny part being right here. That's going to form the diaphysis. And then we have our two ends, which are going to be the epiphysis. But right now it's just all cartilage. And then as we move on, we're going to start calcifying that cartilage in the middle, start developing a little bit of the periosteum and the spongy bone. And then we're going to grow some blood vessels. And now it's really, really starting to look like bone tissue. And eventually those osteoblasts are going to make that compact bone really, really strong on the outside. And those osteoclasts are going to give us that nice medullary cavity for our red bone marrow to be housed and protected. So once again, this happens in pretty much all other bones. And it's just, it's just easier to show you the long bones because the, it's easier to draw than like a, a vertebra or something like that. So once endochondral ossification is complete, the only cartilage within the bone is the growth plate or the epiphyseal plate. And as I mentioned, this is how the bone will actually continue to grow through puberty and the teenage years until the bone is completely fully grown. So take a look at the picture and you'll see the bone on the left is significantly smaller than the bone on the right and what we have is an epiphyseal plate near this distal end that you're also going to have one near the proximal end too I'll draw it in right there so what actually happens as you can see in the notes is the cartilage cells inside of the growth plate start to divide which makes it thicker and it starts literally separating the two ends of the bones and it pushes pushes them apart. So if you've ever heard kids complaining at night from their legs or their arms hurting and the doctor attributes that to growing pains, it literally is a real symptom. It is very, very painful. Literally the bones are being split apart due to this very fast growing cartilage. Now, once the cartilage starts growing, that signals for bone for those osteoblasts to start calcifying the cartilage. And then it stays stationary for a little bit, and then the next growth spurt occur months later. And this process continues and stretching and stretching and makes the bone longer and longer until it is fully grown. Now, when it's fully grown, that epiphyseal plate is gone. There is no more cartilage, and your bone is 100% bone all throughout the bone. But there is a little scar from all of that cartilage being there for a good portion of your years when you were growing. And what they call that scar is the epiphyseal line. So epiphyseal lines are only found in adults that are fully grown versus the epiphyseal plate can be found in anybody who is still growing. And once again, this is 100% hyaline cartilage. So now that we know how long bones grow lengthwise, how you get taller, we can talk about how they grow in diameter. And you actually already know the answer. We've talked about this before. Osteoblasts kind of hang out near the outside in that periosteum area, and they make the bone thicker. And meanwhile, we have to make more room for the bone marrow, right? Otherwise, we're just going to have a really big, thick bone and not enough space for that bone marrow to live in. So those osteoclasts in the endosteum take over and start chewing and breaking down the bone and that gives us more space on the inside. So both osteoblasts and osteoclasts are active during bo bone growth in the diameter. So we're making the bone taller through the growth plates, we're making it wider through the osteoblasts and osteoclasts. 
So regardless of what type of ossification we're talking about, the osteoclasts have to break down bone in that medullary cavity in order to have space for the bone marrow. Now, growth and resorption happen all the time. Remember, the word resorption means breakdown. So whether you're a baby, whether you're 20 years old, whether you're 95 years old, your bones are constantly growing and resorbing. However, at specific times during our life, one can be more active than the other. Sometimes you can grow faster than you break down. And as we age, breakdown becomes apparently more active compared to growing. So we do need you to know the age differences between these processes. As you can see in this bullet point in the middle of the page, first one says from infancy to about young adulthood. So people are, are different. You know, some people are done growing in, in their teens. Some folks are done growing in their younger 20s. But pretty much from birth until your late 20s or even close to 30, gro growth is exceeding resorption. So what that means is those osteoblasts are working harder and they're just more active than those osteoclasts. Now, as soon as you hit your late 20s and early 30s, you hit this kind of plateau where it's equal. The same amount of osteoblastic activity is equalized with the same amount of osteoclastic activity. So one isn't trumping over the other. And then as soon as you get out of that age range, as soon as you hit your mid 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and then it keeps going, resorption exceeds growth. So we are breaking down faster than we can actually grow the bone. And the older you get, the closer you get to 50, 60, 70, 80, this phenomenon becomes a little more significant. You tend to break down even more bone in your elderly years. And as you can see, the problem with that is if your bones continue to break down, if your osteoclasts are going kind of nuts and your osteoblasts aren't that active, well, we can break down bone to the point where we can have bone disease or we can easily trip, fall, and shatter every bone in our body, right? When, when somebody falls and breaks a hip, usually it's, it's because the bone was already broken or it was already extremely weak. The bone breaks when you take a funny step and then you fall and you break the rest of the bones. And it's due to this instability because osteoclasts are just very active during these old ages. So what can we do to fix this? What can we do to prevent this or prolong it? Well, from a prevention standpoint, really nothing. As we age, stuff is going to break down. Your muscles will get weaker. They will get less flexible. Uh, your, your digestive system doesn't work as well. Your bones will become more brittle as you age. You can't reverse that, but you can slow it down. You can prolong it. And how we do that is stress. And what this is called, or the principle is called Wolf's Law. And even if you've never heard of Wolf's Law, you, you probably are aware of what it is. Wolf's Law says if you use something, it will get bigger, better, stronger. Right. So if I've never done um, push ups before, if I've never ran a, a 5K or a 10K before, at first it's going to be very, very, very hard. But as I train, as I work my way up, my muscles, my tendons, my ligaments, my bones, my cartilage will adapt and will help my body get in better shape to do whatever we're doing. So the flip side of Wolf's Law is if you don't use it, you lose it. And that's very true at the same time. So as we age, it becomes even more important to put stress on your bones, specifically weight bearing stress. So yes, uh, swimming is a great activity, uh, awesome for the shoulders and for cardiovascular fitness, but it's not putting any stress on your skeleton. So that's not always the best way to go. What you want to do is actually put stress on the bones with gravity in play here. So as you put stress on the bones, what happens is spongy bone, that trabeculae, gets remodeled to accommodate. So it gets thicker and stronger because you're putting extra weight on it. And the compact bone starts kicking the osteoblasts in the gear, starts waking them up, and it can help offset or prolong the effect of aging. Once again, you can't reverse this. You're not going to get younger, but 
you can be active in your 60s, 70s, 80s, even in your 90s if everything works out okay and you can apply this throughout your daily, weekly regimens. In this upcoming section, we're going to be talking about fractures. We're going to talk about how we heal those fractures and also different types of pathology that could lead to a potential fracture in some cases. So a fracture in a bone is the same thing as a break in a bone. A break is a fracture, a fracture is a break. Now what happens pretty much every single time you break a bone, you do damage blood vessels and therefore usually there is some type of bleeding and bruising accompanied with that. However, because the bones are so rich with blood flow, we have all those central canals and those canaliculi connecting all parts of that compact bone because the trabeculae is so interwoven, uh, the spongy bone is so interwoven with that trabeculae and the blood vessels, this stuff heals pretty efficiently, pretty quickly. And you can see in a healthy adult and a child, repair can be complete within six months. Usually if you break an arm, you can be put in a cast in about six weeks or so, you're, you're good to go. Um, but it does take longer for the bone to fully heal, regenerate all new blood vessels, and completely clean out debris and make new solid bone tissue. Now, if we are elderly, or we're sick and you know, compromised, or we've broken the bone multiple times, uh, sometimes that process can be a little delayed. So you can take a look at the picture on the right. There's all sorts of different breaks, uh, and some of these are really cool to look at. You can see that we have a closed break where you just break the bone, but it's still intact regard regarding the skin, so there's nothing sticking out of your skin. Uh, the gnarly ones that you want to YouTube sometime when you're bored is the open fracture where you broke the bone and the bone sticking out of your skin so you can see white stuff, that's pretty crazy. Usually that requires some sort of surgery. We have transverse fractures where it just transversely cuts across the bone. We have spiral fractures where we get this kind of uh, oblique slant. And you can look at some of the other ones. Comminuted is where it kind of just breaks in the pieces like glass, all sorts of uh, neat types of fractures. So another clinical scenario for you here, uh, we have a six-year-old named Sam who's learning to ride his bike and he falls off and unfortunately he breaks his arm. When x-rays are taken, they confirm that because they, he broke not only the humerus, but he also broke his scapula. So how will the bones repair themselves and grow? So we know the osteoblasts and osteoclasts are going to be involved with this, right? We have to get rid of the old broken damaged tissue and we also have to repair it and build brand new tissue. So let's talk about how the healing process actually begins and what ends up happening on the next slide. So as I mentioned, when you break a bone, there is bleeding because there's so many blood vessels throughout both the compact and spongy bone. When you actually shatter or break off part of the bone, those blood vessels are going to break with it. So what happens is blood starts pooling in this area and it eventually clots and it kind of forms this little blockage or tumor looking structure called a hematoma. And what that does essentially is it basically cuts off the blood supply to the damaged area, killing all of the bone cells in that area. So not only is the bone broken, but the bone cells remaining in there begin to die due to this hematoma. So then what happens is we start remodeling this. So the hematoma is a good thing. It is a sign of inflammation. Uh, you want blood, to, if you break your ankle or your elbow or something, you want it to pull up and get swollen to an extent, right? You want to control the swelling, mainly to control the pain. But part of the inflammatory response is for this thing to fill up and pool with blood. So that is a normal occurrence, a thing to happen. So next, what we're going to do is we're just going to manage it with some duct tape. What we're going to do is we're going to build some kind of junk fibrotic tissue. We're going to throw some collagen fibers in there. We're going to throw some cartilage in there and just kind of hold it all together. And basically in this, uh, what we call a callus. 
So some of it's soft with the cartilage, some of it's a little more stronger with the collagen fibers, but we're basically just kind of putting a little natural cast around the broken bone. Meanwhile, blood vessels can start to reroute and heal. And then once the callus has been there for a few weeks, we can actually start growing new bone tissue. So the growing is gonna be happening thanks to the osteoblasts. And we still need to remodel and get all that extra dead stuff and junk out of there. And that's gonna be done thanks to the osteoclasts. So the big key terms we introduced here was the hematoma happens almost instantaneously when you start bleeding. The, the body kind of blocks off that injured site and a lot of swelling happens. And then we form this callus and the callus can stay for several weeks until we start actually rebuilding and remodeling that bone. So on this slide, we're gonna introduce four different bone pathologies and talk about what causes some of them and some of their symptoms. So we'll begin with osteopenia. Osteopenia is kind of simple, straightforward. It's when your bone mineral density is lower than normal. So as we age, as we talked about, as soon as you really get out of that kind of uh, mid thirties range, your osteoclasts will start outpacing your osteoblasts. And if we, we talked about Wolf's Law, if you don't use your bones a lot, your bone density can start breaking down even faster. Um, if you are a female you're, and, and later ages, your bone density can start breaking down faster. So that is osteopenia. It's just the bone density is not as strong as it used to be. And severe osteopenia can be diagnosed as osteoporosis. So as you can see, osteoporosis is just 2.5 deviations below normal. So it's two to three times more severe than osteopenia. And basically from a structural standpoint, everything's still there. The central canals and the lamellae and the trabeculae is all there. It just becomes weaker, it becomes more brittle and, and fragile. And in, in severe osteoporotic cases, or we talked about uh, walking, stepping wrong off a curb or something, and you break a part of the bone in the hip and then you lose your balance and you break everything else. Uh, something as, as innocent as a sneeze or a violent cough can actually break a bone in the spine in severe osteoporosis just due to the stress and the weakness of the bones. So it's very, very common um, in, in America. Basically, once you're age 60, 70, 80, uh, the, the, uh, a good portion of the population will have this. And the reason why females are so affected with this is because of menopause. So the sex hormones in guys and gals kind of regulates bone density. It helps with that. And as soon as menopause strikes, estrogen and sex hormones start plummeting. And when that happens, that deficiency is just a little bit more prevalent. The osteoclast can kind of take over even faster. So uh, other risk factors for osteoporosis. If you're really, really small, if, if you have a really petite body form and your mom and dad were small and your grandparents were small, you're at more risk for this because if you're small, your bones are small, right? And therefore your bones are only so strong to begin with. Um, lack of exercise, we talked about that with Wolf's Law. A diet that's not really that well balanced. If you don't have a lot of protein and calcium and vitamin D in your diet or not getting enough vitamin D from the sun, that can kind of contribute to this and speed this process up. Uh, other things, smoking. Smoking really messes with your bone density among 15 other things that it does. And um, issues with uh, the thyroid gland. And we, we talked about hypercalcemia and hypocalcemia, right? With calcitonin and parathyroid. If that mechanism's messed up, that can also lead to issues with your bone strength, specifically with that parathyroid hormone and those osteoclasts, right? So how do we treat this? How, how do we uh, prolong this or try to prevent this as best we can? Once again, we talked about that with Wolf's Law, right? The more you use it, hopefully, it's gonna get stronger and kind of build accustomed or get used to a certain regimen and your bones have to respond, right? 
the next disorder that we're going to discuss is osteomalacia. Osteomalacia, very different than osteoporosis and osteopenia. Osteomalacia is not so much a weakening of the bones due to it becoming more brittle. It's more of a softening of the bones due to a vitamin and mineral issue. So what happens is your calcium and your vitamin D levels are very depleted, very low. And both of those lead to very, very weak bones. Now, this situation, osteomalacia, is the adult form of the disease. The children's form of the disease is called rickets. So it kind of works just like chicken pox, right? If you have chicken pox as a kid, we call it chicken pox. If you have chicken pox as an adult, it's called shingles. It's the exact same virus. Uh, and more times than likely when you have shingles, it's the chicken pox that you had when you were a kid just rearing its ugly head out. So it's the same principle, same disease process, rickets, osteomalacia, same disease. It's just rickets are in kids. The problem with rickets is because the kids aren't fully done growing, uh, this can be a lot more painful. Those growth plates get messed up and the bones start to actually bow, especially in the leg area and the pelvis. Very, very painful. So the good news is in America, this has been, for the most part, eradicated. This really doesn't happen in the United States because the FDA, uh, back in the day when this was a big deal, said we need to start putting calcium in the food, right? So if you go to the store and buy some Pop-Tarts or some Fruity Pebbles or something, you can look at the box and you'll see that there actually is calcium in that food, even though there's pretty much no other minerals or vitamins in there. Uh, some foods are what we call fortified into our, or some minerals and vitamins are fortified into the food groups. So we are able to get these minimum requirements. Now, in the case of a developing nation where they may not have access to uh, vitamins or fortified food, this can become an issue. Also, if the mom is deficient and she's breastfeeding her child and not giving them formula, if the mom has low calcium or low vitamin D, the kid is actually susceptible to this as well. So that's osteomalacia and rickets. And this is actually a really easy fix. As long as the bones don't bow or bend too much, uh, you can reverse this disease really easily. All you have to do is give the person calcium and some vitamin D. It's actually uh, very treatable, very reversible, which is, which is good. And then the last pathology, as you can see, is heterotropic ossification. And this is uh, kind of opposite of the first three pathologies we talked about. Heterotropic ossification is when you start growing bone in places where there's not supposed to be bone. And generally speaking, this it happens due to trauma. There's some genetic issues that can cause this, but for the most part, trauma is going to induce heterotropic ossification. So uh, you see this a lot as, as notes say in surgery, if we're getting a total shoulder replacement or a total hip replacement, you should YouTube what a hip replacement or a shoulder or knee replacement looks like. It is not a very delicate surgery. It is extremely, uh, let's say archaic. <laughs> there, there's hammers and chisels involved. It's, it's very, very violent. So with all of that trauma during the surgery, uh, the body kind of freaks out and sometimes it has to repair itself in the only way it knows how to repair itself by growing the very strongest thing possible and that's bone tissue. So even though you got that brand new shoulder or brand new hip, sometimes you can start growing bone outside of all that metal to strengthen that area. We also see this in sports injuries when folks get kicked really hard or a hockey puck or a... Um, uh, a baseball or something right to a, a quad muscle or a hamstring muscle, something like that. Uh, the muscle is so damaged, it's so inflamed that the only way the brain copes with that is it forms bone tissue inside the muscle to deal with that weakness, that instability. So a lot of times this can be painful, uh, having bones in places where it's not supposed to be, it can press on nerves and cause severe pain. Sometimes you actually have to go in for a second surgery and get the extra bone tissue removed. It just depends on the case. 
All right, let's do a quick review on cartilage, and then we'll talk about how cartilage grows, and we will be all done for this chapter. So remember the characteristics of cartilage. We have the circle-looking structures. They're called lacunae, and inside the lacunae are those cartilage cells. We call them chondrocytes. And then everything that's not inside the lacunae is called the matrix. And depending on what cartilage we're talking about, we can either, either have a really clean and neat matrix, we can have a bunch of collagen fibers all throughout the matrix, or we can have a bunch of elastic fibers all throughout the matrix. And if, if this is not ringing a bell or if I'm going too fast during these last few slides, go back to chapter four when we first introduced this and we, we looked at each tissue uh, individually and I showed you your pictures and everything. Uh, make sure you review that information. Now remember, similar to epithelial cells, cartilage doesn't really get that much blood flow. It's pretty avascular. So if you were to damage cartilage, it doesn't really heal that well, which is not a good thing. So the three types is hyaline, elastic, fibro. Make sure you know which one's the strongest. Make sure you know which one is the most common or popular. Make sure you know which one is the most stretchy out of these three. And depending on which cartilage we're talking about, they all have unique jobs. But for the most part, it's to protect the joints, right? And to uh, prevent any damage to that bone tissue. So hyaline cartilage, by far the most abundant. When in doubt, hyaline cartilage. And the reason why is because your articular cartilage is hyaline cartilage. So if you have 206 bones, Almost every single one of those bones join with another bone, and there's cartilage between those bones. So that's a very large number. Uh, the cartilage between your ribs, inside your respiratory system, tip of your nose as well. So this one has a very, very clean and neat matrix. Elastic cartilage. A lot of elastic fibers are found in the matrix, and this stuff is really, really stretchy. We talked about three locations where they're at. The main one we want you to know for right now in this module is the outside of the ear. When we get to the last module for the semester, we'll talk about the eustachian tube, and then we'll introduce the epiglottis in more detail next semester. So outside ear, really, really flexible, bendy, twisty. And then we have fibrocartilage, and instead of elastic fibers all throughout the matrix, we have collagen fibers. And remember the three big places that fibrocartilage is located are places where we need the most strength. So between the two pubis bones, we have something called the pubic symphysis. Between all of your vertebral bodies or the bodies of the vertebrae, we have the discs, and they are just mainly filled with collagen fibers, this fibrocartilage. And then we have the meniscus in your knee. That helps with all that weight bearing that your knees have to take on for us. And then for our last slide, we're going to introduce a little bit of new information. So although cartilage doesn't have a great blood flow, it still has to grow, right? It still has to change because some of those cells can die. So there are two ways that cartilage grows. One happens generally during our childhood and teenager years, and that is this first one. It's called interstitial growth. And then the second one happens more during adulthood, and that's called appositional growth. So as you can see, the other name for these interstitial is endogenous growth, which endo means inside or within, right? So as you can see, it says the cells within the substance of the tissue divide and secrete additional matrix. So what cells are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about those chondrocytes. Those chondrocytes actually secrete matrix. They are live cells. So the chondrocytes secrete matrix and then they, they start spreading out from each other. So literally, how this growth occurs is from the inside out. So picture that we have a square of tissue. I'm going to draw it here at the bottom. We have a square or a rectangle, and then we have all these cells secreting this jelly matrix in all different directions. And what that's going to do is increase pressure and forces along the edges, and it's going to force this rectangle to grow in size and get bigger. So it's literally growing from the inside out. And once again, that occurs more so during childhood and our adolescence. 
once we become an adult and we continue to be an adult, uh, we go through this other type of cartilage growth called appositional growth or exogenous. And exo obviously meaning outside, right? So this is basically growth from the outside out. So we have something called the perichondrium. Remember the periosteum is just the outside of bone tissue, all those collagen fibers. The outside of cartilage tissue is called the perichondrium. And all we're doing is instead of growing from the inside out, let's draw that rectangle again. What we're doing is we're taking the edges and we're just pulling those further apart. So picture like you're posting a picture on social media or something and you're making the picture larger. So you're pulling or dragging those corners of those sides. So that's exogenous growth. Once again, happens after we're done fully growing. All right, everyone, that wraps up the skeletal tissue chapter. Let your instructor know if you have any questions and I will see you next time.